If there were cataclysms on Earth every 5 minutes, living conditions on our planet would be almost the same as 4.5 billion years ago. Back then, seas and oceans boiled, lightning struck everywhere, tectonic plates changed their shape, lava flowed from volcanoes, and worse, no internet. <laughs> the Earth resembled a vast boiling cauldron where life was gradually being created. If it starts to boil again, this cauldron could destroy almost all life on the planet. Hmm, consecutive cataclysms. Won't hurt to pretend. Let's imagine, shall we? Good morning! You wake up in a small underground bunker. The seismic sensor indicates that a 7-point earthquake will start in a few minutes. You pack a huge waterproof backpack and go upstairs. The underground bunker is protected from seismic activity. It moves with the ground, so you're safe here. But you need to leave the shelter because supplies are low. Also, yesterday, you picked up a radio signal telling all survivors to go south immediately. The coordinates they gave aren't far from your location. You have to hurry, though, before the landscape changes again. You open the hatch and find yourself in the middle of the desert. The sun is almost invisible beyond the gray sky. The ground is shaking, but you're not afraid. There are no houses or buildings, nothing to fall on you. You keep your balance perfectly, and the earthquake doesn't knock you off your feet. It's like jumping on a trampoline. The only danger is the deep chasms in the ground, but you can easily jump over them. After such an extreme morning warm-up, you decide to have breakfast. You take a tin can out of your backpack. You have a few minutes before the next disaster, so you eat and remember how your great-grandfather told you how all this started. Before all of this, the planet was divided into territories called countries. Millions of people lived in them, and then something terrible happened. The tectonic plates started to move, and the air temperature and atmospheric pressure began to rapidly change. In one day, earthquakes destroyed entire cities. Tsunamis and floods washed away the remaining ruins. Volcanic ash blocked the passage of sunlight. Forest fires destroyed almost all vegetation, and eruptions poisoned the air. Only a few people managed to adapt to such harsh conditions, and you are a lucky duck to be one of them. As you finish your breakfast, you're distracted by another ground tremor. Time to move on! Many people travel around the world alone, as they consider it a safer way of life. Some people form small communes, but no one ever stays in one place for too long. Your whole life is in motion, but you don't panic. One of the main rules during natural disasters is to remain calm, so all survivors have steel nerves and excellent physical training. You run a few miles south and suddenly smell something strange. You put on a gas mask. The earthquake has created a limnic eruption. Natural carbon dioxide is released from the ground to the surface. You feel comfortable in a gas mask, but can't run fast while wearing it. Far up ahead, you see a green forest, a rare place that was not affected by fires. You take off the gas mask and go to the tree to take shelter in the shade from the scorching sun. This green area is rich in vegetation. Colorful flowers, strawberries, and many other berries grow here. But you're concerned. Such fertile land comes from being near volcanoes. It spews underground magma rich in vitamins and minerals, so vegetation grows. You can see a high mountain in the distance. This is the volcano. An underground push occurs again and provokes an eruption. You gather strawberries and run away from this place as far as possible. Lava pours from the volcano's mouth and makes a fire in the forest. You unhook a folding scooter with a motor from your backpack and drive away from the fiery mountain as fast as you can. The sky is covered with volcanic ash, but this is not for long. A strong wind flows, grows with each passing second. You realize a hurricane is moving in your direction. You take out a small shovel and dig a hole in the ground. The soil is dry, but you have enough strength to dig a small ravine in a couple of minutes. You dive into the shelter and cover yourself with a protective tent. The hurricane blows the volcanic ash in different directions, and the air becomes clear again. But the fire doesn't stop. The wind spreads through the forest. You get out of the ravine and put on the gas mask again. There's a lot of smoke around, and it's unbearably hot. You know the hurricane couldn't just appear without any reason. 
Hurricanes are formed when warm, moist air collides with the sea surface and rises to the sky, so there's water nearby. Great, because you're thirsty and want to cool down. A loud sound erupts behind you. You turn around. A massive wave of water approaches the fire. Without panic, you take your life jacket out of your backpack, remove your gas mask, and put on a diving mask and fins. The wave blows you off your feet, but you don't drown. Over the years of survival, you have learned to swim very well. You grab a passing tree and wait patiently for the flood to be replaced by another natural disaster. For five minutes, you sail under a black stormy sky that sparkles with lightning. Despite the waves, you try to row south. It's getting pretty cold. You finally see the shore. But this is not a land, but ice. It's becoming colder by the minute. The temperature drops below zero very quickly. And although there's no snow, the cold is becoming unbearable. Hoarfrost appears on the ground, the grass, and the trees. And ice forms on bodies of water at an incredible rate. Shivering people all over the planet raise their eyes to the sky. And their jaws drop in disbelief. The sun has become twice as small as it used to be. It now looks like a distant speck, and it won't be able to heat the Earth any longer. But the worst thing is, there's a huge blazing rock coming right at the horrified spectators from the sky, and the impact with that thing will undoubtedly do a lot of damage. Okay, let's go back to our objective reality. The Earth is exactly in the sweet spot of our solar system. It's neither too close nor too far from the sun making the temperature on our planet not just tolerable, but rather pleasant. Scientists often call Venus, the second planet from the sun, our Earth's evil twin, because it's so hot and inhospitable that no life is possible on it. Of course, there are thick clouds in its atmosphere that rain acid, and the greenhouse gases raise the temperature on the surface to unbearable values. But even if Venus didn't have those, nothing would still be able to live there because of the proximity to the sun. If there was any liquid water, it would evaporate too quickly, leaving life no chance to develop. On the other hand, Mars, going next in line after Earth, is a bit too far away from the sun, which makes it cold and lonely. The temperature on its surface is below freezing, and it never warms up enough for water to stay liquid for long. That's not to mention the lack of atmosphere on the red planet, the element that provides the Earth with breathable air. So, if our planet shifted closer to or farther away from the sun, its temperature would either rise or fall respectively. A few hundred miles wouldn't make much difference. The circling of Earth around the sun is uneven anyway, and we constantly get nearer to our star or fly a bit away from it. The distance that would matter is measured in millions of miles. And yeah, just like I showed you at the beginning of this video, we'd see the sun a lot smaller than we do now if we went that far. The temperatures might not fall at the exact moment of the shift, as there would still be some warmth left. But in the following winter, our planet would probably stay cold forever. The oceans would be covered with ice, and the overall sea level would drop. And ultimately, the ice would reflect more of the sun's heat back into the atmosphere and space, not allowing the surface of our planet to get the necessary warmth. And more ice means less water vapor in the atmosphere. Water vapor captures heat too, creating clouds. So the colder it is, the less rain. The cold and the lack of rain would not let any plants survive for long. So the areas of icy and barren landscape would grow fast, leaving only the areas along the banks of rivers intact for a while. After some time, the rivers would stop running too, either frozen or dried out because of losing their sources, lakes and seas, which would, of course, freeze as well. Any life dwelling near them would disappear. Plants first, and with them, everything else since plants produce both food and breathable air. And with that, the Earth would become a frozen wasteland. 
As for the giant blazing rock I mentioned, it was an asteroid coming from outer space because of the shift of our planet's orbit. Jupiter, the largest planet in our solar system, acts as a natural shield for us against space rocks. It has a huge mass, and most asteroids flinging from outer space get caught in its gravity and fall on its surface. There's no life possible on Jupiter, and its surface is gaseous, so asteroids tend to disappear in it without a trace. Still, some manage to get past Jupiter, where Mars comes into play. It also contributes to our defense by holding the asteroid belt between itself and Jupiter in place. The two planets' combined mass creates a gravitational field that doesn't allow the asteroids from the belt to fly in random directions, hitting everything in their path. If there was no Mars between us and the belt, we'd be used to meteor showers almost more than actual rains. Say the Earth has replaced Mars in its orbit, and now we're hundreds of millions of miles farther away from the Sun. The mass of the Earth is more or less similar to that of Mars, so the asteroid belt is still in its place. The temperatures will still fall, though, and life will soon go extinct. But if Mars stayed where it is, and the Earth just shifted away, it would be a recipe for disaster. There's no chance the planets would orbit the Sun at the same rate because their mass is not equal. At some point, they would collide with each other. Taking their speed into account, they both crack and shatter, perhaps creating another asteroid belt in our solar system. It would be no more hopeful for us if the Earth decided to jump closer to the Sun. Apart from the star seeming more like a giant, pitiless blazing ball in the sky, its heat would melt the glaciers on our planet, making sea levels rise abruptly. The water would flood major parts of the continents, and more surfaces of the planet would be covered with water, which means more heat absorption. That would bring about a further rise in the temperature. Also, those large bodies of water would evaporate like crazy, releasing tons of water vapor and carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. Carbon dioxide is a greenhouse gas that absorbs heat, and so does water vapor. Together, they would trap more and more of the sun's warmth, creating thick, roiling clouds in the sky, almost like on Venus, but without the acid. And that thick blanket of clouds would also contribute to heating the surface of our planet. In the end, the entire Earth would heat up so much that life on its surface would become unbearable for most. Now, you wake up one morning and watch the news while having your morning coffee. They did it again! Those scientists! The news anchor yells on the TV. A report was released a few days ago that the moon is moving further away from Earth's orbit. Its distance extends 2 inches per year. Over the past 2,000 years, it's drifted a total of 260 feet. This isn't too daunting of a distance, but the news has still made people panicked and concerned. They rally together around the planet, uniting to try and stop the moon from escaping Earth's orbit, even though it won't actually leave the orbit for over a billion years. But everyone was focused on the past benefits of the moon. It's obvious life on Earth as we know it wouldn't have evolved without its existence. The moon is controlling the tides and the molecules in the atmosphere. Without it, humans, in particular, wouldn't have evolved. So, with an appreciation of the moon, the top brass ordered the best scientists to come up with a solution to push the moon closer towards the Earth. A giant thruster engine was built on the dark side of the moon. It was ignited, and the thrusts tried to push forward, but the startup power wasn't strong enough to push the moon. Instead, it tilted the moon's axis, rotating it slowly. As the moon rotated, the scientists hurried to turn it off before the engine reached its full power as it was headed off course. The brass didn't accept this and ordered them to continue with the objective. The scientists insisted the math wasn't correct and didn't know exactly what may occur. Their concerns were ignored, and they watched as the engine's power increased. The engine slowly pushed the moon, the distance reducing. But as it was provided at the wrong moment, the angle it was aimed at would provide complications. 
the thrust and gravity from the Earth ensured the Moon followed the orbit at a reduced distance. But with the combination of the initial thrust on an indirect angle, the Moon was directed away from the Earth, quickly moving further off its trajectory on a path to leave the orbit altogether. As you finish your breakfast and turn the TV off, you go outside to look at the Moon. It sits high above, seemingly fine. Surely, the news anchor was just exaggerating. You go to work. The issues of the moon are now just an afterthought. Even if it was true, how could it possibly affect your day? The morning feels normal, just another day at the office, as it turns out. During your lunch break, you head into town and notice on your way that the wind is picking up, getting stronger and colder. It must be a storm approaching. You quickly check on the moon. It appears smaller, about half the size of what it was this morning. But it's midday, so it's supposed to be that size, isn't it? After you finish your meal at the restaurant, you leave to find it's becoming darker. The wind is much stronger than earlier, but there are no storm clouds in the sky. People in the streets are pointing towards the sky, shocked at something, probably an eclipse. As people begin running in the streets frantically, you look above and can't see the moon. Confused by everything, you decide to head home for the day. When you arrive home, you turn on the TV. The news anchor, who is now more serious than earlier, explains that the moon has left the Earth's orbit altogether and is flying off somewhere into space. The loss of the moon means the daily cycle has changed. Now, there are only 6 to 12 hours of sunlight a day, and over a thousand days per year. I only have to work half as much, you say excitedly, pumping your arms in the air. The lack of the moon creates a completely different world. The pull of the moon's gravity is what keeps the Earth in a place at 23.5 degrees angle, ensuring the weather patterns and normal days that we're accustomed to. Baffled by all the scientific information, you go outside to just confirm you aren't being pranked. The shorter working week seems too good to be true. As you look out into the sky, you notice the stars are brighter than you have ever seen. You can clearly see the outline of the Milky Way's arms. The stars are far more numerous than you remember, with Venus glowing far brighter than them all. It's a beautiful sight, but you're not sure whether a clearer night sky was worth the moon's removal. You have never been interested in astronomy. You decide to go to bed. It's a good idea to adjust to the new night and day cycle. You set your alarm for two hours. That should be enough, you say to yourself happily. Tomorrow is Saturday, after all. You need to get up early to go surfing. Gotta catch those high tide waves. You wake up, get your things together, and drive to the beach. The news on the radio explains some issues about how the Earth is now more defenseless to asteroids without the moon. Then they talk about some issues with the tides. Something about how the tide is now one-third the size it used to be before. You're unsure how this could affect the waves. Maybe it means they will be larger. You park at the beach, grab your board, and look towards where the surf should be. It should be high tide. But the sea is somehow a lot further away than normal. You shrug off the hurdle of having to walk towards the water. After a long, enthusiastic walk toward the gnarly waves, your mood changes as you approach, staring blankly at the tiny waves. Upset, you head home. While driving, you listen to the news and pay more attention to the information provided. In place of structured seasons, There are only erratic weather patterns. Winds are faster and stronger, creating more powerful storms. And in some places, there are just stagnant conditions. The equator is no longer always warm. The poles aren't constantly cold. The depths of water shrink. Tides only adjust to the sun's gravity, reduced to a third of the pre-moon depths. Throughout the world, the seas change in altitude shrinking at the poles, and the bulge of water around the equator shifts. That's it for today. So hey, if you pacified your curiosity, then give the video a like and share it with your friends. Or if you want more, just click on these videos and stay on the bright side.